degrees. But what these Israeli naval commanders encountered on the map of Amara was anything but a breeze. It caused a storm of international condemnation. But did Israel fall into a trap? And what was the real agenda of some of those people who call themselves peace activists on board the Free Gaza flotilla? Self-defense or excessive force? What really happened that night? After nine humanitarian activists were killed and many others wounded, certainly that is the question that should have been answered by reporter Jane Corbyn in a professional and balanced manner in this documentary aired by BBC's Panorama just over two years ago. Instead, she embarked into a journey of biased journalistic work, as the following examples show in a very clear way. Here in Gaza, the problem's not so much a lack of food or medicine. There's no easy access in and out, no economic life because of the Israeli embargo. Hamas, which rules here, refuses to recognize Israel's right to exist. The IHH isn't just known for their humanitarian work. Western authorities have accused them of having links to terrorist organizations. We have very clear evidence that at least in four cases, the other side did use live fire. In some of them, they did use the Israeli weapons that were stolen from our soldiers. But at least in one case, they did use their weapon because we found bullets and shells of weapons that is not in use in the Israeli forces. They tried to counter criticism of their military operation by displaying the weapons they found on the ship. Proof, they said, that this had been a premeditated attack by the IHH. So what about the aid the IHH said was the reason for their mission? Some of it's arrived in Gaza from Israel and it's sitting in a warehouse. Mobility scooters, hospital beds and drugs. But I found that two-thirds of the medicines are out of date and useless. Probably about right. Okay. For the troops, it's a routine tour of the city, but for Samira, it's stepping into the abyss. I think it's more wise to stick what these guys say, yeah, not what I say. Don't worry, we've got to get to the top. The destruction is worse than Samira expected. The city has been reduced to a pile of machine gun chewed bricks ripped apart by violence. The killing goes on. Suicide bombs, RPGs, beheadings, medieval style stonings, all are commonplace in the city of terror. These things are extremely bright. It would be hard to believe that the BBC would go to the extent of creating a script for this dramatization of reality that they dared to call documentary. They wouldn't need to do so. The simple fact of putting a young lady in such a hostile environment would surely guarantee the producer the desired result of drama and tears required to move even the coldest soul in Britain. The reality Before of Somalia, the we all know too well. Italian it does not need to be highlighted by the cry of a young model that is suddenly confronting a reality too cruel even for our own imagination. To gain any credibility, this failed documentary surely needed a little bit less drama and more was required to know about the reality of the situation that led to Somalia to be considered a failed state. But who really failed Somalia? If there was any honesty from BBC, that should be the number one question to be asked. <laughs> Uh 
I'm so I thought that actually this is how my life would be if me and my family stayed. Or I would, whether I would be alive or dead, I don't really know. I feel very frustrated and angry that nobody's stopping this torture and suffering. <laughs> what it is. You know, in fact, I probably see more reality from watching EastEnders than I do from watching the BBC News. You know, so that's, <laughs> and that's not an excuse to make everybody go and watch uh, uh, EastEnders, by the way. Sarah from the Global Women's Track. Okay, thank you, Jay. This is a fantastic demonstration. And this is, you know, this is not the first time we've been in front of the BBC because they lied about Gaza, they lied about Haiti, they lied about Congo. That's what they do. You know, and they are the 1%. The BBC and the media, they represent the 1%, and we know that. You know, and we're, you know, we, we're calling them out because what the BBC is spreading racism, they're spreading misinformation, they're spreading Islamophobia and all kinds of discrimination against people of color and against all of us. There's two key media issues and there's two key fights about who's going to be in charge. The first is Murdoch. You know, the Murdoch corruption is now, it's coming out. And what they want to do is take over the media and they want to be in charge of telling us about Somalia and other countries. And they want to be in charge of what's seen as the truth. And Murdoch has got so much power, he's even terrorized MPs. Because he's got information about their private lives, which they don't want to come out. And they've been too frightened to challenge him. And he's also got the police in his pocket. And that corruption on the front page of The Guardian, there's a big story about the, the corruption and the rape by police, which we also want to call out. And they, the media is trying to tell us that what Africa needs is genetically modified crops. But we say no, and the African women say no. And the Indian women have burned hundreds of thousands of acres of genetically modified crops. You know, and the media has tried to tell us if we don't use chemicals, that's museum agriculture. Can you imagine that? They want to be in charge of whether or not we eat. So we have to go to them for seeds and for the basics of life. And we say no to that. And we're taking a lead from the African women because we know even with the dearth of information, we know that the African women are fighting. Af African women grow 80% of the food that's eaten on the continent of Africa. They're the backbone of the movement. They, they ensure the survival of communities. But not only the media, but sometimes even our movements don't speak enough about that. And women are not getting the help they need. And I think when we start to look at women's work, we see that the movement is much bigger than it looks. There's really a lot of us out there. wanted to say was just the second point is about WikiLeaks. Uh, WikiLeaks is uh, they're after Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and they're using the charge of rape and sexual attacks but we think that he should have a fair trial just like anyone else and we know he's being targeted he's being called an enemy of the state because he's released information that's been very helpful to our movements and we know that the people accusing Julian Assange, we already know that they're guilty of genocide, rape, murder, starvation, plunder, and we want them brought to court first. Let's, let's put them on trial first, and then we'll deal with Julian Assange after that. I wanted to underline Jay's point about the NGOs. The NGOs are hand in glove with the media, and the media often takes their information from the NGOs. The NGOs are tied up with the military and we need more facts about that because then we'll know exactly what they're up to. The same people who are attacking Somalia and Haiti and Congo and Iraq are also attacking us here. We remember Troy Davis. We remember Trayvon Martin. We remember Mark Duggan. And we remember Rodney King who's being buried today. You know, and our sisters are there speaking at the funeral and speaking to the family to try to get out the truth about what's happened to Rodney King. Okay, so we have a lot to learn from each other. We have to confront the racism within the BBC and the misinformation. 
and we have to all be, we're all Somalians, we're all Haitians, we're all Palestinians, we're all Congolese, we're all Tamils, and that's the way that we can win. Thank you very much. And the people are not real. I mean, for me to tell me that I'm not real African, that kind of just sums up the baby stands on everything, really, when it comes to these struggles and the people who come from this oppressed country. Not only are they not silencing the story, but that stands the real person speaking to Robert, challenging him on, the, on, on, on his state on Somalia. And I ask him to actually cover, because they have been getting paid to cover the issues in Africa, as well as the African issues for people who live in these countries who are having to be African. As people know, we offer an open microphone if people want to come and talk about why they hate the BBC and their coverage. Come and use this microphone. It's an open microphone. Come and say your piece. Let's just remind ourselves, we don't have any illusions in the BBC. We had some of the employees come out in their pompous demeanor and come and say, the BBC isn't biased. We got our reporters in Nigeria. We got our reporters in Somalia. We don't need your reporters in Somalia. Where's the voice of the Somali people? We don't hear that voice. We have to go and seek it out ourselves. We don't need the BBC to report on the world because we know the way you see the world. You see the world as something that you can go and walk around and take your bits of information and tell the world about it. We don't want your view of the world. We want our own view. We understand what solidarity is and the BBC has no inkling of that at all. We know the BBC represents what the British government wants the people in this country to see of the world. The BBC and the British government don't want us to be united with the oppressed of the world. When we see information about Gaza, does the BBC tell us that the people of Gaza are suffering from occupation from the Israeli state and that Israel without Britain would not exist? Is that how the BBC talks about Israel and apartheid when it tells us about the hunger strikers? Oh no, because they didn't really tell us about the hunger strikers because that's not news to the BBC. What is news to the BBC? When Greece had their election just recently, suddenly Greece is on the pages. But when people were killing themselves in Greece because they couldn't afford food, where was the reports about that? We have no illusions with the BBC. Don't come here and try and tell us that you're not biased. We're not interested in whether you're biased or not. We don't want your information. We can tell our own story about the world. You don't understand Somalia, and you don't understand Nigeria, and you don't understand Congo, and you don't understand Palestine, but we do. You don't understand Venezuela, you don't understand Cuba, but we do, and we will tell our own story.